Hello folks, you are listening to PSN Radio. I'm Live Mike, and I'm joined by an awesome guest today, folks. I am joined by none other than Dr. Robert Sanjanis, the producer of the forthcoming movie, The Principal. Dr. Robert Sanjanis, how you doing? I'm doing well, Michael. Thank you for having me today. Oh, great to have you here. Doctor, the last time uh, I interviewed you was August of last year, mm-hmm. and my goodness, uh, what has, boy, a lot a lot has happened since that time. 22,000, over 22,000 people uh, watched the interview that, that you and I did when I was with MSI Radio, mm-hmm. and hundreds of thousands of people have watched your, the principal introduction to trailer uh, yeah the trailer Mm -hmm. and uh just amazing a lot of criticism there's been a lot of critics amazing that there would be criticism considering the fact that no one has uh, seen this film yet Mm -hmm. are you amazed with the reaction that people have had to the trailer uh that's a hard question um I guess I never cease to be amazed at uh, the actions of human beings <laughs> in a general way. Mm-hmm. So in that light, I guess I'm not uh, surprised. Uh, in another way, um, you know, I, I'm i an optimist, and I expect better of people. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess the hope inside of me uh, hopes that they will be more rational and logical about their views, but most of the views seem to be knee-jerk reactions, emotional reactions, and uh, I I understand that part of human nature, and so it doesn't upset me too much. Uh, On the other hand, you know, that's not going to make the world get better either, you know, if we all just give knee-jerk reactions to things. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm ambivalent on the answer. I don't know whether to say yes or no. I guess I'm somewhere in between on that. You know, uh, doctor, I just want to read the, uh, the, the intro to the, to the trailer if I could. You have a, a little, little blip there and I think it's just per- perfectly how you, how you've worded it. Everyone knows that the ancient idea of Earth in the center of the universe is a ridiculous handover from a superstitious age, right? Mm. Modern science has proven that we are nothing special. We inhabit, in Carl Sagan's words, an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. Well, prepare to be shocked. The principle, destined to be one of the most controversial films of our time, brings before the public eye astonishing results from recent large-scale surveys of our universe. Surveys which disclose unexpected evidence of a preferred direction in the cosmos, aligned with our supposedly insignificant Earth. Set for theatrical release on September the 9th, 2014, the principle includes narration by Kate Mulgrew, uh, Star Trek Voyager, uh, from her fame there, stunning animations by BUF that worked with uh, Life of P and Thor commentary from prominent scientists including George Ellis Mikio Kaku yeah, <laughs> Kaku, Michio Kaku. Right, uh, Julian Barbour Lawrence Krauss and Max Tegmark tracing the development of cosmology from its inception Stonehenge the Great Pyramid at Giza through the Great revolution of Copernicus to the astonishing new discoveries of Earth-oriented alignments in the largest structures of our visible universe. The principle leads us face-to-face with the question and the challenge. What does this mean for the future of mankind? I I myself, uh, doctor, believe that the principle is going to be a film that goes down in history. Marking the watershed moment that reshaped the hearts and minds of man, directing his attention back to reality, God, our loving Creator. I, I, I wonder if you feel the same. Yes, I do. Um, I felt I have felt that way for 
the four years we've been working on this project. It'll come to four years probably in October. But yeah, I and that's the reason I started the project because that, that was exactly my goal to to change the hearts of men, like you said, back to reality. And uh, the reason that's important is because without a firm anchor in their mind about who they are and where they are and what their significance is, it's very hard for man to function at least properly uh, without taking advantage of the creation. That is, if you don't feel there's any significance here to your existence, then you're going to act in a certain way. You're going to look at your fellow human being in a different way because you you will do things to him that you say to yourself, well, there's no consequences for that because I'm and he are just a matter of time and chance. Uh, we were just a cosmic accident, and um, there's no repercussions for whether I treat him good, bad, or indifferent. And, uh, you know, being the selfish beings that we are, the, the tendency will then be to go to the negative, the, the bad things that you can do to people to take advantage of him, and you will take advantage of, of the creation itself and and uh, your family and, and everything that's precious to you uh, will be affected by that mentality. So, uh, yeah, that that's where I started out with the because uh, you know you you as well as I know that this world has gotten crazier and crazier as the decades go along. Uh, you know, here now we're talking about homosexuals getting married and and we're still killing babies by the truckload before they ever see the light of day. And uh, you turn on the internet or the TV and all you see is um, displays of sex and. Marriages are are now sixty percent uh, divorce rate. Uh, you know, it's just every area of life that you look into, it's just deteriorating by leaps and bounds. Back in the fifties and the sixties, you know, we were in America. At least we were in the heyday of our of our um, existence. But seventies, eighties, nineties, and two thousands come along, and it, it just snapped. Something just snapped. <laughs> And uh, and I grew up in that era, and uh, it was very hard. So uh, before it gets any worse for my children, and I have 11 of them, I want to try to make a better world for them. And I can think of no other better way to do it than to not only teach them the truth, but to teach the world the truth. And this is a truth that, as you said, and everybody recognizes, and that's why there's such a vociferous uh, reaction against it, that knee-jerk reaction I was telling you about, uh, they, they know what it means. They know that if you if the earth is in the center, it changes everything. Nothing nothing escapes it. So, yes, to your answer, yeah. That's definitely- you know, Augustine, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Doctor, uh, Augustine said that all creation reflects God, doesn't he? Doesn't he say that somewhere, uh, I don't know exactly where, but didn't he say that creation itself is a reflection of God? Yeah, he did. Uh, and many other saints said the same thing. Yeah. And so the reason why I bring that up is when when you consider, first, uh, and there are people that are listening to this program on this station that are atheists, okay? And what we're talking about here um, is probably something that they may not have ever thought about or considered. But when one thinks about a personal loving God that creates man, okay, placing him on this planet, and the way in which he constructed the universe, he would, God does not deceive nor can he be deceived. And he would want man to be in contact with reality from the moment he was created, from the moment he was conscious. Therefore, when you see the sun rise in the east and set in the west, he wouldn't want that to be deceptive, you know? And and it seems to me that he would want that to be the reality. So, I mean, it seems to me, like, I'm just thinking about it psychologically. Mm. Um, It seems that God would want 
man to be in contact with reality and if that uh, wasn't the case uh, where you have you know the entire universe uh, moving in a direction with earth as the center point then I think it would be it would be almost a deception to the mind of man. It would almost be confusing to the mind of man. You, you see where I'm going? Now? Yeah, yeah. And let me add to that because you're you're on a great point here. And um, let me add to it by going back to Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one starts out with the earth in in verses one and two that's dark and void, and then. God says, let there be light. And then he creates the firmament on the second day, then the plants on the third day, and then the sun, moon, stars on the fourth day. Now, it's the, the way that people who don't want to embrace geocentrism sometimes interpret that chapter is they will say, well, that's just written from man's perspective. You see, that's the language of appearance, uh, as if man was there and this is what he would see. So, God, God kind of uh, accommodated man uh, to uh, put it in his language so that whatever appeared, it would appear as if uh, man was looking at it from his perspective. The problem with that, uh, with that answer is that the first five days of Genesis are not from man's perspective. They're from God's perspective. Because there was no man living, you see. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, God's building the creation from His point of view, and and uh, that totally changes things. That now we don't need a language of appearance anymore, because it's totally from God's perspective, who is omnipresent and sees everything. So if He chose that kind of language. Well, then that, like you say, God cannot lie nor be deceived. So God can't lie to himself, right? Mm-hmm. So he's writing this without man even existing, and so he can't lie to himself. So what he writes must be the exact reality. So anyway, just to add to what you were saying there, I think it's a very important point. Yeah. You know, um, and and talking about Genesis, um, I know that Stanley Yaki uh, wrote a book um, about Genesis or, or part of Genesis, and um, I was wondering, do you have any comment on on how you would compare and contrast his notions to your own? Yeah, Stanley Yaki, uh, a Hungarian uh, scientist who became a Catholic priest, taught at Seton Hall University for many years. I think I corresponded with him once. I'm not positive because it was so long ago. But he's the t- typical Catholic um, who has been enamored with Einstein and Lemaitre, Father Lemaitre, the the Belgian priest who uh, was also a scientist and created the Big Bang Theory. Uh, He grew up in that era. Uh, um, Yaki did. And uh, this was coming off the the evolution surge that was happening in the Catholic Church with uh, uh, Teilhard de Chardin and many of his followers in the early 1900s and so on. So a lot of these Catholic uh, intellectuals grew up in this sort of Copernican, Darwinian mold that they thought was the answer. This was it, you know. And then Einstein, of course, came along after that. So you had the the tripartite uh, intellectual... Uh, triangle there that <clears throat> was basically uh, uh, indestructible as far as they were concerned. The, these guys had the answer and not, nobody was going to say anything different. And that was early on in the, in the 20th century. And then they began to find out that it wasn't as neatly wrapped as they thought it was, whether it was Copernicanism or Darwinianism or Einstein's relativity. There were holes. I mean, there were major holes uh, that science, scientific data was putting into these three theories. And uh, we didn't really start to understand all this until, let's say, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and, and now we're at a time, and this is why exactly we made the movie, we're at a time now where the data is just dripping from uh, the telescopes and the microscopes to 
show us that these three theories, Copernicus, Darwin, and, and Einstein, are just totally contradictory, totally full of holes. They don't, they can't stand on their own weight, and it's a house of cards just waiting to fall. But Yaki grew up in that era, and um, <clears throat> there was no persuading him of anything else because at that time, and he was, he was an older gentleman. I think he, when he died a few years ago, he was in his late 80s. So uh, he had been around a while, and he didn't get to see a lot of this new evidence. And if he did see any of it, he could sort of fluff it off because it wasn't backed up by even further evidence. But now that's changed, but, of course, he's not living now. So, uh, yeah, he, he would have – and what he would do as, as a theologian, he would say that Genesis 1, which we were just talking about, uh, was not written by Moses – uh, it was written by the Jews who were in Babylonian captivity uh, from 587 to 515 B.C. And the reason they wrote Genesis 1 was not to give us a creation factual story, but to give us the antidote to the Babylonian god Marduk, that they had been uh, exposed to when they went into pa Babylonian captivity, the, the Babylonians were promoting Marduk as the uh, the god who created the world, and, and he was his supreme god and all this. And so the, the Yaki's theory, and it's not just Yaki's theory, it's, a, it's the theory of the documentary hypothesis, uh, but Yaki uh, embraced it just like many other Catholic intellectuals did, uh, which said that the Jews wrote Genesis 1 as a com com competitive literature against Marduk. They wanted to make the, the Hebrew God bigger than the Babylonian God, and so they made up the story about creation. And that was all there was to it. You see, there wasn't any truth to it. It was just the fact that they wanted to beat Marduk, and, and then, uh, you know, they, they got out of Babylonian captivity and went back to Jerusalem. And they were all happy that they had this new creation story, you see. The Yaki believes that, you know. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. It, sounds, it sounds very similar to the kinds of things that you find with uh, um, those scripture scholars that have uh, completely given themselves to the historical critical method. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I guess that's another, that's another story. But the, you know what's amazing to me, Doctor, is the, that, um, Catholics, okay, um, alleged solid Catholics that are, we're all members of the mystical body of Christ here, have been so unbelievably critical of you. It's, for me, uh, I'm trying to think of a better word than revolting, mm -hmm. um, that describes the relentless personal attacks against you. I guess, you know, I'm curious if these folks are aware of the many, many logical fallacies known as ad hominem argumentum that they're committing against you and anyone that, um, that, uh, you know, is a part of this production. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid to say, uh, one fella, Carl Keating. I own one of his books. I mean, when I was in, when I was, uh, before my time uh, in in school in the seminary, I I did some a lot of apologetic studies, and one of the books that I bought from him was Catholicism and Fundamentalism. I'm sure you're familiar with mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, uh, you know, it, it, I just I don't understand it. I'm trying to figure out why th these guys who are our brothers in Christ are so uncharitable in. Uh, in words, um, you know, with the written word, I don't know if it's spoken word, but I definitely know it's written. I've read it, and it's disappointing, mm. uh, you know. But, um, you know, do you have anything to say about that? I mean, I, what is it? Is it is it because there's this desire on the part of some in the Catholic Church to move towards uh, this grand ecumenism? That's doing it, and they're afraid that this is going to be a stumbling block in the in the movement towards this global ecumenism. I I, I don't know. I, I'm trying. I'm like grasping at what could possibly be behind this. 
that we're all Catholics. Yeah, and, there's, and it's so like, many, it's, there's so yeah, many ways to look at that. Uh, uh, are you are you done with you, what you were going to say, or did you? Want yeah, to... yeah, I'm Doc. I'm sorry, I was yeah. going on long there. No, that's okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure I got every angle to look at before I, I said something. Um, first of all, I would say you know the word Catholic today means a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. There's there's very liberal. Catholics, there's semi-liberal, there's conservative, there's traditional, there's Sadi Vacantis, there's Pope Pius V, Pope Pius X, there are, uh, and everywhere in between. Okay, so today, to use the word Catholic is um, kind of hard to pin down who exactly your target audience is there. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, you're going to get a different reaction from each of those groups, and I've and I've charted them. Basically, I, I can I can pretty much tell where somebody is based on how he reacts to the geocentric issue, and I can tell whether he's liberal, conservative, traditional, whatever. Um, anyway, let's deal with a guy like Carl Keating. Now, Carl is you know he's done a great job for the church uh, for the past what 30 years or so, and you even said you have one of his books. I have a few myself. And I, I take nothing away from Carl uh, for doing a, a great work of defending the Catholic faith. Um, but Carl is in the uh, same situation that Stanley Yockey was in. Uh, Carl has been, he has grown up with this uh, Darwinian, Copernican, Einstein triangle of how to view the world. And so I don't fault him uh, for being in that milieu uh, and it's, it's very, and if I were him, if I were in his position and, and he were coming up with a geocentric idea and I hadn't studied it, and I know Carl hasn't studied it because he told me himself, I sent him my book many years ago and he said he hasn't read it. And I don't think he intends to read it. So if you're ignorant of the science and you have a preconceived idea of the science because that's what you've been taught, well, yeah, you know, a guy like me coming down the pike who's basically turning everything upside down, and that's, you know, literally and figuratively, I'm turning it upside down, you know. Uh, yeah, I can see what his reaction is going to be. It's going to be fear, really fearful. And so what do you do when you're fearful? Well, then you begin to, if you can't beat him in the data, the math or the science or whatever, I mean, you can try, but you're not going to, to be able to beat them. At best, you're going to be able to get a draw. Well, what do you do then? Well, then you start getting real personal, you say, and then you start attacking the person, and you try to discredit him. You try to attack his credibility. And I understand that. Well, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying I understand why people do that. And so I expect it. I anticipate it. I am not surprised when it comes. So I'm able to basically, from that vantage point, take a lot of it without getting, you know, my dander up and without getting upset and uh, being able to go on and continue my work because I've, I've calculated it all out. I know it's going to come. I knew this four years ago when I began to make the movie. I knew it 11 years when I began to uh, write the books. So uh, I understand what human nature is and why it does the things that it does. Now, again, I'm not excusing it, and, you, and sometimes I'll reach a point where I, where I say, now, he, now Carl, being a reasonable man, has to reach a point where he either says, i got to pull back uh, because this is getting really nasty and I may be falling into sin, or he's going to ratchet it up. And I don't know if he's reached that point yet or not, but uh, he may soon uh, because he, he's recognizing that all his efforts to discredit me and to shut this movie down and to shut the whole idea that we might be in the center of the universe down is not working. Uh, Mark Shea is finding out the same thing, uh, and, and a lot of the other followers are finding out the same thing. This is a lot bigger than they thought it was going to be. And as Gamaliel once said to the uh, Jews who were trying to stop Christianity, you know what? You may just be stopping God or trying to stop God. And if that's the case, you're going to lose, you see. Well, so, you know, I believe this is a movement of God because I believe God is, 
he's fed up with this world and he wants to give one last chance to change it. And I, he, there's no better way to change it than to turn it upside down and let people begin to see a whole new vision of the world from the right side up, you might say. So uh, with these... Um, with these ad hominem attacks, um, you know, they really don't phase me. To be to be perfectly honest with you, they don't phase me. What happens is it backfires on them because now we have the publicity, <laughs> we have all the objections, and we can answer the objections real easy. And the only way we're going to get the objections is if these people get upset about it and and raise objections. So the more they object, the easier I can. Uh, communicate my ideas because I know exactly where to scratch where the itch is, and uh, that helps me promote the whole, the whole thing. So yeah. it sure know. worked for the passion, huh, Doctor? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> no press is bad press. You know, there, yeah. there were vicious assaults against that, and it was one of the you know top grossing um, private productions ever, wasn't it? I don't know how many. Yeah, the five hundred million. The- Five hundred million, yeah, and that was just domestic. Domestic, and then I think he sold the rights for another half billion uh, for the uh, foreign uh, uh, rights. Wow! And uh, yeah, so yeah, it, it, uh, well, of course that was about Jesus, you know. So. <laughs> uh, but you know, on the other hand, there's been a lot of Jesus movies that haven't been have even you know one tenth of the success of that. So nowhere, yeah. Near. So the controversy definitely did put that movie on the map. Um, but, you know, the, these other assaults that they have on me, like, you know, I'm an anti-Semite, I'm a Holocaust denier, you know, this is, this was interesting because uh, this is why I say Carl has to reach this point where he has to decide whether he is now sinning against his brother by ratcheting it up. And one indication of that was... Uh, Carl had written on his own blog a few months ago that he was going to contact the ADL, or no, B'nai B'rith. He was going to contact B'nai B'rith uh, and help and get their help to stop the principal. Okay. Oh, God. Yeah. And 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 is this like a personal crusade with this guy? What doesn't he realize the harm that he's doing? I, I, I just. You have this. Oh, I'm I'm sorry for interrupting you, Doctor. Please, please. <laughs> I'm just looking at it like, are you mad? What are you doing? This is a great thing. The Principal is a great film. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I I've seen the promo, and I've done some research, and I can I can only I presume that it's going to be a great film, and it's going to have a great effect on the minds and hearts of of men. And, I mean, why would you stand opposed to this? Are, I mean, uh, don't you see how uh, all of the good that's going to come from this? Yeah. Well, see, I think I mean, it was Arthur Schopenhauer who said, all new ideas go through three stages. First, they're uh, violently opposed, then they're ridiculed, and then they're accepted as if we always believed it. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh my. It, yeah, it, Carl it, is in the second stage right yeah. now, you see. You know, I, I just, I really, I guess we need to do, and I, I wrote this, I think, on one of the, the Facebook pages. I mean, we need to do some Navinas, you know, for, for these folks. Because, uh, you know, if they refuse, absolutely refuse to even open your book and read that, uh, the trilogy of, of, uh, of that work that you did, uh, Galileo was wrong, the church was right, three volumes. Uh, each of them over 700 pages. I mean, that's like as exhaustive as you can get uh, a look at this topic, folks. Um, but, I mean, if you're not even willing to crack that book open, you're invincibly ignorant. Yeah. And and, and uh, how are you going to overcome that? Well, there are some that have cracked the book, and they've taken their shots, you know, but we've been able to answer all their shots. So even when they do crack the book, they haven't been able to win. And, they, and I guess that's frustrating for them. But there's a larger picture here that I want to reiterate, and that is, um, you know, this fear factor. Uh, you know, what do you do when you start fearing? Well, then you start calling names and you start using ad hominem and uh, you start discrediting your opponent uh, because you fear. And what do you fear? Well, you fear his ideas. And what are his ideas? Well, let's look at it this way. The Catholic Church has worked very hard since Vatican II 
to reform itself to be appealable to the world. Okay, that, that's basically what Vatican II was all about. Now, we're not going to get into whether you know Vatican II is right or wrong or indifferent. I'm just telling you what the mentality was. And how do I know this? Well, none other than Father uh, Car- uh, Joseph Rotzinger, when he was a uh, priest, was, attended Vatican II. And he wrote when he was Benedict the Sixteenth, many years later after Vatican II, reflecting on what happened there, he said, look, he said one of the main reasons Vatican II was formed, was initiated, was because of the Galileo issue. Okay? Now that's, that's a mouthful right there. The church had been hurting for so many years because Newton came along and Einstein came along and all these scientists were saying, church, you got it wrong. For how many years did you say that the earth was in the center of the universe? And what, 16, 1700 years? And all of a sudden, we just showed, without that much work, that you're wrong. And so the church was smarting after that for, gosh, about 150 years or 200 years. And what are we going to do about this? You know, what are we going to do? We're going to have to face the world and say, yeah, we, we made a mistake, you know, and, and uh, we'd, we'd like to get back in your good graces, and we'd like to learn from you. After all, you're the ones who discovered that, that the earth is revolving around the sun. And, well, maybe God has given you information he hasn't given us, and, and we can work together, you see. And there's the spirit of ecumenism right there. That's where it all starts. And that was right from the horse's mouth. I didn't make this up. This is what Cardinal Ratzinger said and Pope Benedict when he became Pope. John Paul II said the same thing. When he formed the Galileo Commission in 1981 to study the Galileo issue, uh, he said that the Galileo issue gave us a whole new stimulus of how to interpret Scripture. Well, that's a mouthful, too. What does that mean? Well, what he means is that prior to the Galileo issue, the Catholic Church had no problems interpreting scripture very literally i mean look at our faith who, who which which is the only uh, religion in the world that takes matthew twenty six twenty six, where jesus says this is my body and says well we're going to take that as literally as jesus said it if this is his body where well, we're going to call it his body that means somehow some way he, his body his 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 uh, divinity his soul Everything is somehow physically present or spiritually present with his soul in that Eucharist. You see, we're going to take that because that's what the scripture said. All right? And that mentality lasted for, for many, many centuries into the second, far into the second millennium. I wonder if what you're saying coincides with the level of assent that we give to the Pontifical Biblical Commission. There was a time when a, a great a level of assent was given to that. And then I guess it was probably sometime after the Second Vatican Council that we kind of walk away from uh, the authority of the magisterium in regard to when the, the interpretation of sacred scripture. Am I wrong? Am I off the mark, Doc? That's a, that's a, a slightly different issue because their okay. power, uh, will be actually the authority they had to um, submit official interpretations was taken away in 1970 by Paul VI. Prior to that, they were actually an arm of the magisterium. And, uh, yeah, and what they said everybody went by. So there was a kind of shift in, in the, that uh, whole um, area there with the BBC. Um, but, uh, and, and right now the PBC is very liberal. They have been very liberal and modernistic in their approach. And they're still in the Galileo mentality. That's, that's how they interpret scripture. You, you might want to say, if you could put it in a capsule, that the, the basic hermeneutic of the Catholic Church uh, since Vatican II, has officially been to look at Scripture through Galileo's eyes, you see. And that's, and that's because they all thought that Galileo was right and the Church was wrong. I can't impress that upon you enough as the very reason Vatican II was formed 
and all the resulting changes and, and understandings of the church and history and science that issued from that because of this Galileo issue. Uh, now, it's, it's ironic, however, that although Vatican II had planned on dealing with the Galileo issue, they never really dealt with it. Not one word about Galileo is in any of the 16 documents of Vatican II. The closest that the Church came at Vatican II to changing things was a statement they said in Gaudium et Spes, which said that science has its domain and the Church has its domain, and we'll, leave, we'll let science do its thing and the Church will do its thing. That's basically all it said on that science issue. Whereas prior to Vatican II, they thought that they could actually, you know, have the church make some kind of official or unofficial apology for what had happened. But, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't allow that to happen, did he? You see? It's, yeah, it seems that that position would, uh, uh, not to, not to put the church against itself or any of the church documents against themselves as contradictory, but, uh, when you look at Fides et Ratio, uh, I think reason and scientific reason would, would definitely be part of that, uh, where you have faith and reason in harmony with one another. Um, you know, they shouldn't be opposed. They should be, yeah. they should be in complete accord. And right. Thoughts. They should be, yeah. And, uh, that's what we're striving for, you see. Mm-hmm. The encyclical you just mentioned, uh, Fides et Ratio, it, it, it was very hard for John Paul II to bridge that gap between uh, science and theology without capitulating to the science end of it. See, what he's really saying there is, okay, science has given us these facts, and the church basically is going to have to adjust to these facts. That's that's the message in Fides et Ratio. And you sort of... What he did was he sort of put a, a veneer over it by saying, well, yeah, faith and reason will come together and they will understand each other and work together. But what he really meant, to, what he really said there was science has basically upset the church's traditional belief in cosmology, and so now the church has to adjust. And we'll call that the, the amalgamation of science and religion. You see. Now, I, wow. what, I, what I'm trying to do is make it a lot easier for him. You know, I also believe that uh, faith and reason need to come together. But the way they're going to come together is by showing that the Church's traditional understanding of cosmology based on its biblical hermeneutic of literal interpretation is not wrong. It's right. And none other than science itself is telling us that it's right. Because now we've got a lot more information than we had when Newton was around or when Darwin was around, you see. So if there's any way to make faith and reason coincide together, it's by the method I am proposing. It's not the method of saying that Galileo was right. It's the method of saying Galileo was wrong. And now the, the science is showing us that he was wrong, you see. Doc, oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I've said all I said there, but I just want to reiterate this one point sure. that um, the very what John Paul II admitted uh, in his um, his statement in 1992 on the Galileo issue was that you know a new stimulus to interpret Scripture was created by the Galileo issue. Well, let's put some feet on that. What does that really mean? Well, it really means is the church has departed from the literal interpretation of Scripture, at least in certain areas, than it had before, before the Galileo issue. Now, that is a dramatic, cataclysmic change in the church's perspective of Holy Scripture. Can you, I mean, are you grasping this? What he just said, you know? Just because this guy Galileo said the earth was going around the sun, well, that changes everything we see in Scripture as to how to interpret this book, this sacred book of God's Word. 
I can't tell you uh, anything more earth-shattering than that. Now, what has that done for the rest of the doctrines we have in the Catholic Church? Oh, well, see, now we can apply that same mentality that we don't have to interpret Scripture literally anymore to many other areas, you see. So then you get all these ideas about sex and psychology and what, uh, uh, other religions and uh, all, all kinds of things just start to pop up. And you start to say to yourself, well, gee, did the church interpret these wrong too because she took such a literal interpretation of Scripture and we found out from Galileo that we shouldn't be doing that? Well, yeah. That's the answer that they came up with. So all these things started to change after Vatican II. Now, I'm not putting the blame on Vatican II. I'm putting it, the blame on the interpreters of Vatican II. They were the ones that said, all right, now we can look at Scripture in a totally different way, much more loose and relaxed way. We're really not bound by the literal meaning of Scripture anymore, you see. We've learned this. God told us through Galileo. So you see how it affects everything, it affects every area of life, not just science. Yeah, it's amazing. It's almost like these guys that had agendas, and um, I hope I I don't get myself in trouble by saying this, but I think the, the people that are listening to this broadcast right now would agree that there was a Masonic infiltration into um uh, at least part of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, okay? Mm-hmm. And these guys that got in there used this as leverage mm-hmm. to move forward their agenda. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I really think that, um, that when you, when you present it like that, the way you just did, and talk about how this one event with Galileo, how that is, uh, you know, I, you know, we should we we should look at sacred scripture with that as our lens. Mm. That's scary stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's just this the same thing David experienced when he met Goliath. If you read that story very carefully, this Goliath was taunting the Israelites for days. You know, days turned into weeks, and you had all these illustrious soldiers in the Israelite army. I mean, they were defeating people left and right. You know, God was with them, you know. And all of a sudden, this nine-foot giant stands up and says, all right, I dare any of you guys to come out here and try to whoop me. Okay? And that's basically what the Galileo issue is. It's this giant Goliath out there. And if a Masonic uh, infiltrator comes up to a Catholic priest and says, you believe that the earth is in the center of the universe and doesn't move? Oh, my gosh, you're really stupid, you know? And you intimidate people. You 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 put the fear in them, like, oh, gosh, I'm not with it. I'm not modern. I, I've, I've believed the Bible all this time, and now they're showing me the Bible's all wrong, and what am I going to do, you know? And so you're in this very um, precarious situation. And, and you're weak, now you're weak, and you, you lose your faith, and, and so you gotta grab onto something. So, okay, well let's do this. Let's pat each other on the back and shake hands, and we'll learn from each other, and we'll try to make the best of it, you know? And that's what's happened for the last 50 years, basically. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, and I agree with you. And, and a, a Mason or whoever it is, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, they're gonna use that to intimidate Catholic cardinals and bishops into thinking that they, you really can't put your trust in Scripture. Come on now, okay? That's that's old stuff, okay? Let's that get on with first, it. modern the, living now, you know? That is, that is the, absolutely. That is the first step, Doctor, uh, in the movement to atheism, is uh, the, the assault upon sacred Scripture as the inspired, inerrant Word of God. If you can dispel that, if you can erode that confidence in the Word of God, you're on the road down. And uh, but anyway, um, I, I want to ask you this, Doctor. Um, we have uh, less than an hour left in, in this broadcast. I'd like you to present the best uh, evidence, present evidence that we have that show uh, that 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 show 
geocentrism. The, the, the greatest evidence, in your opinion, where is it? Is it the CMB, or, or where would you look and say, guys, start here. This is great stuff, very persuasive. Yeah, well, I think there's just two basic ways to look at this. And one was one is with the the um, stuff outside of our solar system, which is, like you said, the CMB and the galaxy arrangements and all that. And then the other is right within our, our earthly environment with experiments that were done to test whether the Earth was moving. So if you let's start there. Uh, we, uh, you know, <laughs> they've always, men have always understood the, the nature of relative motion, you see. You drive in a car and you see the trees move. Well, is it you that's moving or the trees that are moving? You see, unless you know the exact answer to that, what you're seeing is relative motion, okay? So you see the sun and the stars moving around us every day. Well, are we moving or is the stars and the sun moving? Okay, that's called relative motion. So this this had always bothered uh, scientists, at least when they came of age around the 1800s. Uh, so the the idea is, well, let's test it. Let's test to see if the Earth is moving. How are we going to do that? Well, one guy came along. His name was Dominique Rego, and he said, I know how to do that. Let's test it with starlight. So if if the Earth is moving, and I'm looking at this star through my telescope, well, uh, you know, I, I I take pictures with a camera. And I know that I have to change my focal point if I move further from the object that I'm photographing, you see. Well, the same thing would be true with starlight, he says. If, if the Earth is moving toward the star or away from the star, then the focal point of my telescope is going to change. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> it it, it uh, agrees with all the uh, elements of photography that we know about and all the uh, understanding about lenses and, and uh, magnification. So what did he find? And this was in the early 1800s. We found that he didn't have to change his focal point. That's in, no, that's interesting. He didn't have to change his focal point. Well, you would if the Earth was moving toward or away from the star, you see. So that was the first indication they had that something was up, that, that you know, it was not all uh, nice in paradise. Uh, uh, the, 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 this raised a lot of questions. So a couple guys came along after that, um, Armand Fuseau and uh, Augustin Fresnel, and they tried to answer it. And they said, well, here's what happens. Here's what happened. The reason you didn't see a change in your focal point is because the ether in space is uh, being carried by the Earth, and that uh, carried the light in such a way where you wouldn't be able to see a focal point change in your telescope. Okay, And that was called the uh, Fresnel drag theory. And uh, so that held for a while. It was an ad hoc theory. Nobody had proved it, okay? But it, w it, it made it sound good. Oh, well, here's the reason why you didn't see the Earth moving, you see. <laughs> so, uh, and, and so another guy came along and said, well, I don't know about that, all okay? right? His name was George Bedell Airy, and Airy says to himself, well, let's do this. Let's look at that star again, and we're going to use two telescopes this time. And we're going to fill one of them with water, and keep the one uh, not filled, well, it'll just be filled with air. And we're going to point these two telescopes at this star, and if the Earth is moving, then what's going to happen to that light being coming from the star is when it hits the water telescope, it's going to go slower, and because the light is now, t the light coming from the star is tilted, because the Earth is moving, well, that means that the light beam from the star is going to hit the side of the telescope in the water telescope. And it was perfect. They had worked it out all mathematically. Yeah, you're right, Ari. That's exactly what's going to happen. So Ari does his experiment, and what happens? Well, the light beam does not hit the side of the water telescope. It goes right to the bottom of the telescope, right through the eyepiece. The same as it did in the airfield telescope, right? So what does that tell you? Well, that tells you the Earth ain't moving. Yeah. Right? That's what it tells you. As a matter of fact, the experiment was called Aries failure because he failed to detect the Earth moving. All right, so now we had Arago, we had Aries uh, doing their experiments. All right, so this meant that we really had to find another test to make sure that what they were finding was correct. And so um, 
uh, uh, Maxwell, uh, James Clerk Maxwell, had suggested to Albert Michelson, well, here's an experiment you might want to do uh, with light. And it's a very sophisticated, very sensitive experiment, and it was actually backed by Alexander Graham Bell. That's where they got the money. He had become world famous by this time. And so they did it in 1881, which was 10 years after Airy had just done his experiment and found out that, you know, the Earth wasn't moving with his two telescopes. And uh, lo and behold, what did they find? Well, the Earth isn't moving, okay? And the principle behind this experiment was if we shoot a light beam toward the way we think the Earth is moving around the sun, so we're going to shoot, shoot this light beam uh, in a... Um, would that be a westerly direction? Yeah. And uh, we'll shoot this light beam in the westerly direction, and we'll shoot another light beam perpendicular to that, say north and south. Okay? And when these light beams, they, they will we'll make them bounce off the mirrors, and when they come back from bouncing off these mirrors, well, the, the light beam that we shot westerly should come back at a slower rate than the one we shot north and south. And the reason for that would be what? Well, because if you're shooting the light beam in the direction the Earth is moving, well, it's like if you were swimming, you know, in a, in a river that was flowing downstream and you were trying to swim upstream, well, you're going to swim slower than you would if you, the, the river wasn't moving at all, you say. There's going to be an impedance there. There's a resistance. A resistance, yeah. yeah. So what do they find? Well, no resistance. <laughs> okay. So now they had the third experiment showing them the Earth isn't moving, and wow, what are we going to do now? Okay, it's you know the old saying, three strikes and you're out. Uh, well, that was pretty much in the offing at this point, and so they were scratching their heads, scratching their heads, and couldn't come up with an uh, with an explanation. And finally, a few years later, this guy named Hendrik Lorentz, a Dutch physicist, very world famous. And, Everybody knew he knew what he was talking about. Said, "I got an idea. Here's the idea: when when uh, that uh, light beam was shot in the westerly direction of the where, where the Earth is going around the sun, well, what happened was instead of the light beam being affected, what was affected was the the apparatus, the experimental apparatus, the arm of the what they call the interferometer. Uh, that was affected. And how was it affected? Well, it was affected." because the resistance that we expected for the light beam actually hit the, the, the experimental apparatus, and it shortened it. It shortened it, you see. So that means that the light beam coming back didn't have as far to travel, and, and if it doesn't have as far to travel, well, then that means it's going to look like the Earth isn't moving, you see. And uh, so, wow, that was an ingenious answer to, to the, uh, the problem. Uh, and everybody loved it, you know. It, even though it was ad hoc, there was absolutely no proof that a moving object shrinks as it moves. Uh, they used this because they had nothing else. They were scratching their heads for almost 15 years until Hunter Clarence came up with this solution. And uh, he said that there's ether in space, and this ether is, is making the arm of this uh, apparatus shorten, and therefore that's why Michelson saw that the Earth wasn't moving. All right. Now, of course, the obvious answer to it is, no, things don't shorten because, first of all, you have no proof for that. Yes. And uh, this, the obvious answer then is the fact that the Earth isn't moving. Okay, it's just obvious. That's, at least consider that as a possible answer to this experiment. You see, instead of just dismissing it altogether. But no, you see, they knew what was at stake. They knew what was at stake because if they had admitted that the earth wasn't moving, well, that would change everything. That would show that the Catholic Church was right against Galileo. That would show that science wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Although science, of course, has, would give us this answer that it wasn't moving. But but what they were making of science wouldn't be all that it was cracked up to be. Because, see, science at that time was considered to be the enemy of the church because science was going to show us the true answers to everything. And the church was just stuck in tradition and mysticism and, and all these rituals and stuff and really didn't know what it was talking about, you see. So they knew what was at stake. So they had to come up with some reason why the earth appeared not to be moving. 
And, and one reason was as good as another, but this one was, was the one that stuck. And so they, they, they were basically stuck with that answer. They, they really didn't know where else to go. The only thing that changed was when Einstein came along a few years later, and he said, well, you know, you really got to be honest here. There is no proof that ether will do this to mechanical apparatus. We have no proof that extra, uh, electrons will be squeezed by this ether. As a matter of fact, when we invented the ether, uh, we, we understood it as a substance that had no friction. That, that would give no pressure to a material object. So how can we say it now that it's putting stress on a material object to shorten it? You see, we're contradicting ourselves. So what he did, instead of uh, keeping the ether, he did away with the ether. He says, all right, we'll have to accept the fact that the arm of Michelson's uh, apparatus shrunk, but we can't say that it was ether. What we're going to have to do is just say it's a principle of nature. This just happens. It just happens, and we're not going to go into why it happens. It just happens. <laughs> Man. I mean, can you see? Uh, you see what the pressure they're under. Yeah. See, they have to be scientists because they're scientists, and they have to find a scientific answer, but they can't find one. So they, they have to they, they, they perform mental gymnastics to try and come up with a solution as to how can this be. And uh, amazing. Yeah, and because we all know the Earth goes around the sun. That's what Copernicus told us. You see? And we had this dramatic event between the church and Galileo, and the outcome of that, of course, was that Copernicus was right. So that's the foundation that they start with, without ever examining whether that foundation is correct or not. So, anyway, and if you read their literature, it's amazing. You read Einstein or Lorenz, he says, well, Copernicus told us that, that the Earth was moving around the sun, so we're going to have to answer these experiments on that basis. But nobody ever went back to Copernicus and found out whether he was right or wrong. And so, as a matter of fact, if you go back and look at Copernicus's writings, oh my gosh, talk about uh, obscure, uh, uh, pedantic, uh, just uh, confusing. As a matter of fact, when he started his work at around 1510, and uh, at the request of uh, Pope Leo to, to fix the calendar, and, and Copernicus thought, well. Uh, the way I can fix the calendar is by rearranging the solar system, and, and we'll, I'll make it work better, you see. And all, actually, all he had to do was add one more day to the calendar to, to make it work, but nobody knew it then. Uh, but anyway, so that's the impetus that he started with. And when he started, he had this great idea, oh, yeah, if I put the Earth outside and put the sun in the center, and things are going to work a lot better. By the time he published his book in 1542, the, the year he died, uh, he had uh, almost twice as many epicycles in his system as his rival Ptolemy, <laughs> whom he had ridiculed wow. back in 1510. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. The exact count of epicycles is, is still up in the air, but if you read, go, if you go read Copernicus's book, that's what you find. Any, any novice is going to see all these circles there and say, what are these? Well, these are Copernicus's epicycles. But when did you ever read in grade school or high school that Copernicus had epicycles? Michael, did you ever read that? No, I never heard it. Never, never. No. never. <laughs> the only one that had epicycles was Ptolemy, you see, because he had this cockamamie system that never worked right, and he had to add all these little epicycles. Yeah, that's the myth that's going around, you see. As a matter of fact, Ptolemy's system was more accurate than Copernicus's, and it was closer to Kepler's uh, elliptical orbits because Ptolemy had this thing he invented called the equant that allowed the planets to go around the sun in non-uniform orbits, the same as Kepler discovered when he, when he uh, invented the elliptical orbits. You see, they, the planets were going around in non-uniform orbits. So Ptolemy and Kepler were very close. Copernicus... Because he wanted to keep the circle as the perfect uh, shape that he got from, he got this from Aristotle, the, per, the circle was the perfect shape. He wanted to keep the planets in perfect uniform circles as opposed to Ptolemy. And so what, end, what, what Copernicus found out is when you do that, well, you really mess things up. And that's why his system never worked. And uh, so if you really, I mean, if Einstein or Lorenz or any of these guys would go back to Copernicus and actually look at what he wrote and see the difficulty that he had 
and that his system was no better than, than, than Ptolemy's and actually worse in many ways, then they would have found out, well, the basic foundation that we started with is wrong. All right? And so now we need to revamp physics and science altogether and start from the experimental basis. The empirical evidence has to be the foundation upon which we build our science, not on vague notions of, oh, yeah, well, it may be true that the Earth is going around the sun, you see. So there you have it. That's the first way we would do it. We would just go back to the empirical evidence and, sh and show that it is definitive in showing us that the Earth doesn't move. Now, let's add to that just one more experiment. And this was done in um, 1925 by the same guy who did the experiment in 1887, Albert Michelson. This time, however, Albert Michelson, since he had no success in showing that the Earth was revolving around the sun, now wanted to test to see if the Earth was rotating. Okay? He used the same interferometer that he had used in 1887, only uh, uh, this interferometer, instead of making the light beams go perpendicular to each other, they, they went around in a rectangle, big rectangle, and that was for the purpose of measuring the rotation of the Earth. You decide to rearrange the apparatus just a little bit to test for rotation. So he's testing for rotation, and guess what he finds? Guess what he finds? He finds almost 100% of a rotation, 100%, almost 98.6% of a rotation, of a, of a uh, uh, 20, let's call it a 24-hour rotation. Very, very interesting. Now, when you compare that to what he did, you know, how many years earlier was that? Uh, 33 years? Or, no, that would be uh, 13. A couple, couple decades. Yeah, 37 decades. years earlier. <laughs> uh, he didn't measure any movement of the sun, uh, of the earth going around the sun, Okay. And he tried this experiment, gosh, how many times? He tried it, 1881, 87, 1897, and then uh, Morley, his, par his uh, partner, teamed up with another guy called Miller, Dayton Miller, in 1904. They did it again, then 1908. Then Miller went off and did all his experiments by himself for the next 20 years, and guess what they found? They found the Earth wasn't moving around the sun. All right, so Michael says this, all right, so let's test for rotation in 1925. He tests for rotation and gets almost 100% result. Now, how is the heliocentrist going to explain that? Okay, Because in heliocentrism, you must have both a revolution of the Earth around the sun and a 24-hour rotation in order to explain the four seasons and the day-night day -night rhythm. You have to have both. If you only have one, then your system will not work. The heliocentric system will not work. Okay? Now, how about geocentrism? What does it need? It only needs one. It only needs a rotation. It doesn't need a revolution because it says the Earth isn't moving. It only needs a relative rotation because the geocentrist says that the universe, the sky, the space that we see out there is rotating around a fixed Earth. So if, if that's the case, well, how fast is it going to rotate around the fixed Earth? It's going to rotate 24 hours. And that's exactly what Michelson found in his 1925 experiment. <laughs> <You see>? Awesome. <laughs> yeah. awesome. Okay? So the, yeah. the geocentrist has no problem with the empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. It's just plain as day to him. Yeah, well, it's it's incredible, isn't it? You have all of this evidence, you have all of this scientific evidence and observation, and yet, you know, the guys that set out to 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 prove uh, against it had evidence that proved it. Yeah, you know, it's like a, it's it's incredible. It is, and, and especially and, when you find out that this 1925 experiment that Michelson did, you can hardly find it in the literature. You got to go searching real deep to find it. And, and another, it's been buried. It's been buried. Yeah. Yeah. And here's here's one more thing that will 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 add some more um, spice to this. Uh, there was a guy named uh, Sil uh, Ludwig Silberstein, who uh, was a, uh, a relativist, just like Einstein, 
uh, was an expert in general relativity, and that's the second theory that Einstein had uh, invented in 1915. And uh, he knew that Michelson was going to be doing this experiment to measure the rotation in 1925, all right? And uh, he says, well, gosh, um, if, if, if it shows that there is a rotation, and that would mean that there is an ether, because the only way that you can measure the rotation would be the fact that there is ether out there that you can measure against, you see. Mm-hmm. So he says, he, Silverstein says, says to himself, well, if that's the case, then um, we won't be able to use Einstein's special relativity theory to answer that experiment. Uh, now, that's important because special relativity was the theory Einstein invented to answer Michelson's first experiment, the one that was trying to show that the Earth was revolving around the sun, you see? The one that says that the length of the apparatus was shortened, well, that's special relativity, okay? And remember, that's the one where Einstein said, well, we got to do away with the ether that Lorentz was using, and we'll just say it was a principle of nature that this apparatus was shortened, you see? All right, now mark that, mark that. What he said was, we're going to do away with the ether in the special theory of relativity, okay? And we're just going to say that this apparatus shortened just by a principle of nature, all right? So they did away with the ether, but then Michelson comes along again 37 years later and does his experiment in 1925 and finds 100%, almost 100% rotation, and the only way he could do that is if there's ether in space. Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) <laughs> problems in River City <laughs> for special relativity. Why? Because special relativity said there is no ether. And Einstein said if there is an ether, then special relativity is falsified. So Michelson finds ether in 1925, and this Ludwig Silberstein is trying to find an answer, and he knows he can't use special relativity because this experiment just falsified special relativity because it found an ether. And it found a hundred, almost 100% rotation. So what are you going to do? Oh, well, now what we're going to do, we're going to use general relativity to answer that problem, you see. General relativity allows the ether. Oh, it does. Oh, well, that's interesting. So special relativity says ether doesn't exist, but general relativity says ether does exist. Tell me that that's not a contradiction, okay? Yes. Because one has a constant and the other does not. Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. Special relativity says that the speed of light is constant at 186,000 miles per second, and general relativity says it isn't, that it can go any speed. Yeah. Okay? So you got major contradictions between these two theories. So Silberstein wants to use general relativity to answer Michelson's second experiment, the one that showed the rotation, because... Because uh, general relativity allows ether. Yeah, but if you go back and read Einstein's literature, although he allowed ether to exist in general relativity, it was what he called a non-ponderable ether. And that means that you can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't test it, you can't measure it. For all intents and purposes, it doesn't really exist, according to our senses, you see. So how does that answer Michelson's experiment, then, Mr. Silberstein? It can't, because Michelson's ether was a ponderable ether. It was so ponderable that he measured a, almost 100% of the rotation of a 24-hour period, you see. So general relativity was stuck not being able to answer that either. So, uh, you know, and I cover this all in my book. It's just a mass of contradictions. The, the bottom line here is that the empirical evidence shows the Earth is not moving, period. Okay. Doc, Doc, can you talk about uh, Hubble, and, and can you also mention the, this, the cosmic microwave uh, background radiation? Sure. And the, yeah. And the, and the latest, the latest data that has come from uh, the uh, the research satellites, I guess. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, let's deal with Hubble first because he's four years after the Michelson experiment. Uh, the, the, the Mount Wilson, hundred, uh, I think it's a hundred-inch telescope, was able to look 
and all the galaxies. For the first time in history, we were able to see galaxies out there in space. And Hubble was the guy that uh, that did this. And uh, so being the scientist that he is, he uh, takes a spectrum analysis of these galaxies. And what he finds is that the light coming from these galaxies is all shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. Now, we all know what a spectrum is. A, a rainbow is a spectrum, okay? You have uh, red, orange, yellow, green, uh, blue, purple, and then deep purple in a, in a spectrum, all right? But when he looked at these galaxies, it, he didn't see a normal spectrum. He saw a spectrum that was shifted to the... So there was more red in that spectrum than normally than you would normally see in white light. So he's puzzling, what's all this about? So he's looking north, and he sees it, and he goes, well, let me point the telescope south. What do you see there? Well, see the same thing. I see this, these galaxies shifted toward the red. Well, let me look west. What do we see there? Same thing. Let me look east. What do we see there? Same thing. So all the way around the Earth, I mean, whatever position he points his telescope, he sees these galaxies with a shift to the red end of the spectrum. Well, that shouldn't be, you see. They sh there should be, I mean, if we're not in the center of the universe, we should see a lot of these galaxies with what they call blue shift, you see. Blue shift is the opposite end of the spectrum. And you can tell whether you've got a blue shift or a red shift, whether the object is coming towards you or going away from you, all right? But Hubble saw that all these galaxies, according to his interpretation of the red shift, they were going away from us. And if you don't see any blue shifts out there when you look at these galaxies, that means you're in the center of it all, you see? <laughs> because if you weren't in the center, then you would see some blue shifts as opposed to red shifts. So he says, wow, this puts us in the center of the universe. This is in 1929 now. Then he wrote a book in 1937 called The, Observational, uh, the Observational Approach to Cosmology. Now this is interesting because... The title of the book is telling you what he's trying to do. We're going to make conclusions in cosmology based on our observations. So he plays the devil's advocate in his book, and he says, well, let's look at this through the observations and conclude just from the observations what would have to be the case. And he says it in his book. He says what would have to be the case is that we are in the center, but the modern cosmologist finds this intolerable. He cannot accept this because this puts us back in the center where the ancient cosmologies put us. And this is horrible. This is horrible for modern science. <laughs> <laughs> he's writing this with emotion in his book, like he's writing a novel or something, you know? And yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you're reading this, and you're going, wow, why, why the uh, mental contortions here? You know, what's going on? Well... He admits it to us that, you know, that the reason is because this is just philosophically unsatisfying for him. And the only way out of it, he says, is to curve the space. And where did he get that from? Well, he got that from Einstein. Because Einstein's theory had come about 20 years prior, the general relativity theory, theory that said you could curve space. And, and Hubble says if we curve space, we can get rid of the Earth being in the center. And so how are we going to do that? Well, here's how we do it. Let's make the universe as if it was a balloon, all right? So when you blow up a balloon, okay, what do you see? Well, all you see is this tiny, thin layer of plastic that's expanding. And just pretend there's nothing in the center, there's nothing in the center of a balloon except air, all right? So basically a balloon has no center. All it has is a surface. And if we make the universe like a surface, then we can get away from having a center, and if we put the galaxies on the surface of this balloon and we blow, keep blowing the balloon up, well, it'll make it appear as if the galaxies are separating from each other, and we will see a red shift. And that's how we can explain the red shift, you see. Just put the galaxies on, a on a, uh, an inflated sphere, 
and you don't have to have a center that way, and there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the first indication of what we're up against. You see, there's something psychologically, uh, a psychological barrier to even contemplating that the Earth could be in the center of the universe. You see, especially by this time, this is three centuries after Galileo affair, a couple centuries after Newton. Uh, you know, so it, it, this idea is entrenched in our modern mindset. Mindset. You see, and that's why Einstein and Lorenz said, "Yeah, well, Copernicus told us the Earth was in this. Uh, I mean, the uh, Sun was in the center. The Earth was going around it. So how could it be any other way? They just couldn't think beyond their nose, so to speak. So, uh, you know, getting to the other uh, uh, issues about the um, cosmic microwave background radiation. Yeah, yeah. The uh, Hubble had said that if there was an expansion of the universe." Uh, that means there had to be a Big Bang, and this is where Father Lemaitre comes in, because if it's expanding, well, then now you're stuck, you see, because if it's expanding, that means it had to have a beginning. So you can't have this steady-state model of the universe anymore that uh, Hoyle, Fred Hoyle, was uh, uh, trying to advocate, and a few other people, and the steady-state universe was an infinite universe. It had no beginning, you see, and that's what everybody had believed up until Hubble came along. But, but Hubble was forced to get out of a Earth being in the center of the universe by giving us this expanding universe, because that's the only solution he could come up with. But what does that do? Well, that makes you forced to have a beginning to the universe. And yeah, so, yeah. you see that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then Father Lemaitre <laughs> says, okay, well, let's just say it was a cosmic egg, that God put a cosmic egg at the beginning of, of time, and it exploded. And it, we now we got all we got here, and there, there. So we satisfy Hubble's expanding universe, right? Mm -hmm. And we we show that there's a beginning to the universe. And gosh, don't we Catholics like that? Oh, of course we do, because that's just like Genesis. I mean, after all, isn't Genesis? Doesn't it mean beginning? Yeah. Well, there's a beginning. So boy, the Catholics and by the truckload, we're we're glomming on to Father Lemaitre's view. That oh yeah wow. he was like the savior you know yeah like, oh this is wonderful we have this guy here if there's a big bang well then there's a big banger yeah this yeah. fits like hand and glove man so you can see why why people like Father Yaki were enamored with this gosh this is the perfect solution the only problem that's not what Genesis said you see yeah. Genesis said the Earth came first if you read Genesis one one and two the Earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved across the waters. And then God said in verse 3, let there be light. You see, so the it's light like, came that, after. That in, he, in Hebrew, it's like tohu, tohu wabohu or something like yeah, that. Uh, yeah, tohu babuhu. Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, but the, the fact is you can't use Father Lemaitre's Big Bang because that contradicts Genesis. That puts the earth first and the light second. Okay. Well, by this time, of course, you know we we know we Catholics don't have to interpret the Bible literally. You see, because Galileo was right and the Church was wrong, so we don't have to take Genesis literally. After all, Genesis one wasn't even written by Moses; it was written by the Jews in Babylonian captivity, just as a competition against Marduk. So you're not going to get any facts out of Genesis, not not the way we used to in the traditional Church. Okay, so anyway, uh, you have this big bang, and if you're going to have a big bang, then you have to have what they call a homogeneous distribution of the matter and the energy. It has to be homogeneous. Now, what is homogeneous? Well, you know that oh, the, the milk cartons we used to get. Sure. Yeah, if you didn't shake them up, then you would. What would you get? You would get lumps. Cream would rise to the top. That's right. And you'd get cream uh, fat lumps throughout the milk. Well, that's inhomogeneous, you see. If it's, hom if it's homogenized milk, then you don't have any lumps in it. So they needed a homogenized universe if you're going to have this explosion, all right? And so everybody was great with that idea. Uh, and then they found the cosmic microwave background radiation in 1963, and, and when they looked at it, it looked homogeneous. And everybody was saying, oh, my gosh, we have proof to the Big Bang. All this radiation we see out there is homogeneous, just like it was homogenized milk. And it's exactly what we predicted, you know? And everybody's just, you know, they're all patting each other on the back until 1978 came. 
you know. And so they, they looked at it again, and they said, hmm, it's not as homogeneous as we thought it was. And, wow, what are we going to do about that? And, uh, you know, that's funny. That's the year that uh, Penzias and Wilson won the Nobel Prize, 1978, for the discovery of this radiation. And, and everybody was happy with Penzias and Wilson because, wow, we thought it was homogeneous. Well, it's not. And so they, by, by what, uh, 12 years later, they send up the satellite uh, beyond Earth's atmosphere to go check this out. Is, is the universe, is this radiation homogeneous or not? Because they were all saying that the radiation came from this Big Bang. And, and so if it's not homogeneous, then we got problems. We got big problems. And so they sent the satellite up called the Kobe satellite and in 1990, and they found out what? Well, it ain't homogeneous. Most of it is, but a lot of it isn't. And it's a matter of fact, where it isn't homogeneous, it's very peculiar because it seems to be lining up with the Earth. In other words, from the farthest reaches of the universe that they could see and, and, and where that, orig- that radiation began, or is is situated, to us, which is, they say, billions of light years away, the inhomogeneities that they see in this radiation are like a line from the Earth to the edge of the universe. Well, that's impossible. How could that possibly be? (laughs) I mean, this was an explosion. How how would this explosion ever know about the Earth? Because the Earth didn't come until 8.5 billion years later, so they said. Why would there be any structure or order... Or system, or or consistency with such an event, right? Exactly. I mean, in other words, unless the Big Bang was a mind reader and knew the Earth was going to come 8.5 billion years later, and so, and somehow it, it allowed this radiation to line up with the Earth to the edge of the universe. Well, yeah. I mean, if the if the Big Bang's a mind reader, yeah, that, that could explain it. But of course, then you'd have to explain how matter has a, an intelligence and a personality. <laughs> You know, so you've got bigger problems there. In other words, what I'm trying to say is there's no way that the, that the initial Big Bang explosion could ever know that the Earth would have, ever exist. Okay? But that's what the radiation is lining up with, with our Earth. So they're scratching their heads uh, in 1990, and they say, all right, we need to check this out again. So they send up another satellite in 2001 called the uh, WMAP, and that's the Wilkerson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. Anisotropy is a word that means the opposite of homogeneous in a, in a, in a round, roundabout way, okay? So in other words, this, this Wilkinson probe is looking for disturbances. It's looking for anisotropies. It's looking for inhomogeneities because that's what Kobe had given them 10 years earlier. And it, they put much more sensitive instruments on this satellite than Kobe ever had. It's like putting a, 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 a more powerful lens on a camera. So that you can see further, you see. Gotcha. So, so they do it, and they find out from this more powerful lens. Not only do they see the same thing that Kobe saw, they see it in much more clarity than they ever saw it before, and it's a, it's it's mind-boggling because uh, it's a clear picture that this alignment that they saw is not due to uh, you know some kind of mistake or it's not their imagination. They've seen it twice now, and it's not going away. And so some guys, you know, were saying, well, yeah, this, it's, it's so disturbing, we're going to call it a special name called the Axis of Evil. And that was in 2004. This was the first people that wrote a paper on this uh, phenomenon. They called it the Axis of Evil. And the reason they called it the Axis of Evil is because that's the time that we had invaded Iraq. And, and George Bush had said that Iraq and a few other nations were the Axis of Evil. You know, we were going to go fight them. So they coined this term for this radiation that they saw in outer space that was aligned with the Earth to the edge of the curious, universe. What a, what a curious description, huh, Doctor? Yeah. <laughs> You said that. Um, please continue. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So they call the axis of evil because why? Why is it evil? Because it upsets the Copernican principle, which says that the Earth is not in a special place in the universe. It's out there, as Carl Sagan used to tell us, ad infinitum. It's out there in the remote recesses of space. Nobody sees us. Nobody cares about us. Nobody even wants us. We're all alone, and we're going to live and die, and that's all there is to it. You see, 
this whole uh, Sagan gospel that was preached in the 70s, 80s, and 90s about our insignificance. He had a book he wrote called The Pale Blue Dot. You know, we're just a dot, a speck of dust in the universe with no significance whatsoever. And all this human drama that we have is all for naught because we're just a cosmic accident. All right. Yeah, it was definitely shot through. Is I mean, I, I watch those programs on mm. PBS, co- the Cosmos, billions and billions of galaxies in the cosmos. <laughs> hey, you're pretty I good at that. Them. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I watched them, you know. But and you're right, he did give that. I mean, it was implicit that we're like insignificant and nothing and worthless, you know. Yeah. But you're right. Uh, please continue. Sorry. And so, and so if we had a homogeneous universe, and what they were hoping for was that we could find it. Then Carl Sagan would be right. You see? Because you could not, if you have a homogeneous universe, you can't distinguish one section of the universe from the other. Just like you can't uh, distinguish one part of the milk carton from the other if it's all homogenized. It's all white milk. You see? There's no direction there. <laughs> but if you, but if somebody sticks a sword through that uh, carton of milk, well that changes things. Because now you have a direction. Now it's not totally homogeneous. It is inhomogeneous in a very significant way. You have this sword sticking through. <laughs> so you could actually plot a course to go somewhere, just climb it on that sword if you were a bug. Okay? Well, that's what they were finding with this cosmic radiation. They were finding that it was like a sword going right through the middle of the universe that they never expected to see. So, yeah, there's, it's a, called an axis of evil because... They just should not be there if you're going to take the Copernican theory to its logical conclusion. Okay, so then, you know, after these papers were written, then some people said, well, maybe it was just a fluke. Maybe it was just a what they call foreground contamination. We couldn't get see through the galaxy. It just contaminated the, the, the lenses and the filters and everything. And, and maybe the mathematics was wrong. And, you know, let's just look at this whole thing again, okay? So... All right, that, so they decide to send up another satellite called the Planck satellite, named after Max Planck, in 2009. It was up there gathering all the data that the two previous probes had gathered, only this time it was even more sensitive than the previous two probes. It's like putting an extra, uh, uh, what do they call those, long uh, lenses on your camera. Now you can, you can see... Uh, Tele- telephoto lens? Telephoto lens, yeah. Okay, to use an analogy. So they, it's been up there for four years, uh, from 2009 to 2013, and in March 2013, they finally get all the data ready from this uh, probe, and they uh, spill it out, and guess what? Yep, it's the same thing that the COPE probe said in 1990 and the WMAP probe said in 2001. As a matter of fact, it's even clearer than it was in the previous two probes. And uh, same thing is there. And, and as a matter of fact, in our movie, we have Max Tegmark, the leader of this whole movement, saying uh, we, we, we had interviewed him once about the, the, uh, the second probe, and he said, yeah, you know, there's the axis of evil is there, but, you know, I'm waiting for the Planck probe to come out, and I want to see that data. So we flew back to MIT to interview him for a second time after the Planck data came out, and Max is on our camera saying, yeah. It's still there. The axis of evil is there. All the things are matching up. There's no difference at all. And and I'm really having a hard time with this, he said. How about that? Yeah, I'm having a hard time with this is basically what he said in the movie. That's and, awesome. Yeah. Now, see, that's that's an honest man because, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, that seems to be like he, he's – He's he's open to the information and he's receptive to the information and he's not like he's like, I'm having a hard time with that that mm-hmm. that that speaks to humility and honesty there yeah it does as a matter of fact if I remember his exact language he says I have to have my brain overrule my gut wow yeah he put it in that kind of terminology and his gut being like you know like Hubble sure. Hubble's gut was saying this is intolerable like you know this is horrible we can't have the Earth in the center of the universe. That's your gut speaking. That's the knee-jerk reaction, you see. And Tegmark is saying, I had to have my brain overrule my gut. So it's there. He didn't know how to explain it. And he was honest in our movie. He was very honest about that. So there you have it, okay? So the, the most sensitive probes we have that have been built by modern man, 
the uh, the most technical uh, way of analysis uh, analyzing these things has been uh, uh, done by many 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 people, uh, and so there you have it. The best modern science has to offer us shows us that the Earth is in the center of the universe. Okay. Okay, folks, we're going to take a little break here. Uh, stand by. We'll be back with more from an absolutely brilliant mind and, and human being, uh, Dr. Robert Sanjanis. Okay, folks, we're back. You're listening to PSN Radio. This is Philosophy Think Tank. I'm Live Mike, joined by um, an awesome guest, Dr. Robert Sanjanis. Dr. Robert Sanjanis, welcome back. Thank you so much for agreeing to uh, go a little overtime here. No problem, Mike. Thanks for having me. I'm sure the audience is, is delighted, as am I. Uh, could you just correct the record on something? I was speaking with you off air. I, I'm sorry, folks. I uh, apologize. I think I said the wrong date for the theatrical debut of the principal. Yes, it's September the 19th. Okay. September the 19th. And right. What, ci- what city is that going to be airing? Do we know yet? Uh, we know, but I can't tell you yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Beg your pardon? All right. Uh, okay. Now, um, w- we discussed the, the, the strongest scientific evidence and observation uh, defending or, or showing uh, geocentrism, geocentric cosmology. Uh, could we talk about the scriptural passages, church teaching, what the Father said, the 1500 years before Galileo kind of arrested control mm-hmm. of, the, of the of cosmology. Go ahead. Yes, definitely. Well, um, I'm trying to figure out the best place to start here. Um, I guess one place I'd like to start and then work backwards is with Pope Urban the Eighth, which was the um, pope who had uh, facilitated the condemnation of. Uh, heliocentrism and Galileo in 1633. You know, there's this myth about Pope Urban that he got miffed at Galileo because in Galileo's book called the Dialogo, uh, and uh, the, the, they made the, the full title of that is the uh, d- two different world systems. It's a dialogue between three characters in the book, and. One of the characters' names name, is named Simplicio, and he's made to look rather, you know, ignorant in the book. And so the word was at that time that um, Galileo was poking fun at Urban the Eighth, and uh, did so through this character Simplicio. And uh, that's the myth that goes around um, that uh, <laughs> that, that uh, Urban was so miffed at Galileo that. Uh, he lost control of himself, basically, and, uh, you know, did everything in his power to condemn Galileo because he had been made a fool of by Galileo. And that is a total myth. We, we deal with that in our book, and we show that even uh, major historians know that that's a myth. Somehow it keeps getting perpetuated. And the reason this is important is because the other side of that coin is that there was no one who was more doggedly pursuing the truth that had been given to him from tradition and the fathers and the medievals and the the, uh, Tridentine Catechism than Urban VIII. Urban VIII, prior to 1633, uh, had been in protracted discussions with the Archduke of Tuscany, uh, Cosimo Medici, and he had, uh, they, they used a uh, courier to go back and forth with their letters. And this occurred over the course of a year. Actually, I spelled, I pronounced it wrong. It's Medici, Cosimo Medici. And uh, as a matter of fact, Galileo was very close to Cosimo, Cosimo Medici because uh, Galileo used to tutor him as a child, okay? So Cosimo had a great incentive to go on Galileo's side, uh, but the Pope, Pope Urban, uh, wanted to get Cosimo on the church's side and wrote these letters to him that uh, uh, they were very long letters, actually, very detailed. And Urban says things in there like, the heresy of Galileo, who is going to upset the whole church with his doctrine, his new doctrine that the fathers have 
uh, said was wrong, and the whole church is against him, and he's, uh, you know, I mean, this language that just goes on and on and on and on, showing you his deep concern that he knew in his heart of hearts that this new doctrine of the of putting the earth around the sun was going to upset the whole church. It wasn't just a science issue for Urban the Eighth. It was a major theological issue, and he had been. Um, uh, taught that, of course, by uh, St. Robert Bellamin and uh, 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 Paul V in uh, the first trial, of the, the first incident of Galileo in 1616. And uh, Robert Bellarmine, who was the great hero of the Protest- uh, against the Protestants in the Protestant Reformation now, okay? So he had earned his stripes. This was no slouch. And he used the same principle of hermeneutics, uh, in the Galileo case that he had used in the Protestant case. So he was being true to his colors, uh, Robert Bellarmine was. And uh, he had said, and the Pope agreed with him at that time, Paul V, that um, the issue here was the veracity of sacred scripture. That was the issue. Galileo could hypothesize all he wanted about what went around what. It really didn't make too much of a difference. But when you said that it's a fact that the earth goes around the sun, then you are contradicting the scripture, which says just the opposite, okay? So um, I just wanted to make that clear, because Urban has been given such a bad rap by Catholics as being this little puny little wimp of a pope who just got all upset and emotional, and that's why he went after Galileo. No. (laughs) This guy knew his stuff, and he was a strong man, and uh, we can tell by reading his letters to uh, the Archduke of Tuscany, written uh, around 1631, 1632. So if you take that mentality back, so the question would be, where did, where did Urban VIII get that kind of mentality? Why was he so stuck on this idea that if you change cosmology, then you're infringing on the veracity of Scripture? Where did that come from? Well, that came from the 1600 years prior to Urban VIII, who was merely... Uh, coinciding with and supporting the ter- tradition that had been handed down to him, starting with the fathers of the church. Now, beginning with the fathers, uh, there is a 100% consensus among the fathers about geocentrism. Okay, now that's interesting, because you don't usually find a 100% consensus of the fathers on any topic. Okay? Here, here. Here, here, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you hardly find the, the fathers talking about the assumption of Mary. You may have one, two, possibly three fathers talking about the assumption of Mary. Well, that's a dogma in our church. It was made a dogma in 1950, okay? You, you hardly find any fathers talking about the immaculate conception of Mary. Maybe one, two, three, maybe maybe half a dozen you could find and make, you know, References to where you could say, yeah, okay, he is. He's talking about the Immaculate Conception there, you know. Um, but geocentrism, wow, uh, all the fathers that wrote on the issue agree that the earth is in the center of the universe and doesn't move, okay? Now, some people object to say, well, you know, but the fathers really aren't, you know, in any polemics on this issue with, uh, you know, they're not really struggling with this doctrine like they were with the Incarnation and the, and the Trinity and all that kind of stuff, you know. But Trent didn't for say... The, excuse so me? Just, may, may I just interrupt you just yeah. one second, Doctor? For those that might not be aware, could you just briefly explain the significance of the Church Fathers as far as the level of assent that we should give them? Yes, well, this is the argument Bellarmine gave to uh, Foscarini, Father Foscarini, who was actually the first geocentrist before Galileo. Uh, he told Father, Father Foscarini that the uh, consensus of the fathers, according to the Council of Trent, is something that we are obligated to abide by. We have no choice in the matter. If the fathers are in consensus on a point of doctrine, then we are obligated, according to the Council of Trent, to abide by their teaching. Okay, so that's pretty strong because the Council of Trent was probably our most dogmatic council we've ever had and probably the most powerful council in the second millennium. Uh, So, uh, you know, to throw that out to an opponent, uh, well, that means something. So if you find a 100% consensus among the fathers, 
on this issue. And Galileo would quote from the fathers, and he would say, uh, you know, uh, he, he, well, he would quote from uh, various fathers to support his position against Galileo, and then he would go back to the scripture, and he would say, these fathers interpret the scripture in a literal fashion. Whatever scripture said, that's what they took, unless it was impossible to do so. Okay, and even then, you'd have to have a qualification, because if you're reading Matthew 26, 26, and it says, this is my body, and you interpret that as being, uh, as Christ being physically present somehow in the Eucharist, all right, well, uh, science doesn't agree with that. Science would say that's impossible. And, and we, even as, as faithful Catholics, would say yeah, that materialistically or scientifically, it is impossible. Right? But we still believe it. Why? Well, because we believe God is above the material world. That God could miraculously... Uh, uh, Transcends the empirical sciences. Yes. Okay? So even then, we have to be very careful when we say that we can't interpret Scripture literally, or, or we can't interpret Scripture literally uh, unless it's impossible to do so. You have to qualify what impossible means there, okay? So there, there, I don't want to give too much leeway to that um, uh, idea. But let's just take it as, as a, you know, prima facie. If it's impossible, okay, well, then we'll consider a, uh, an interpretation other than the literal. Well, we'll, we'll, sim- we'll be a symbol, a metaphor, figurative, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so, And that's what Bellarmine said that the fathers did, not only with the uh, Eucharistic passages, uh, but the geocentric passages. If this is what Scripture said. And as you and I opened up the program with, we said, Genesis 1 was not written from the perspective of man, because there was no man existing until the sixth day, you see. So this is the way Scripture comes to us, and that's the way the fathers interpreted it. They didn't give the excuse of, well, it's the language of appearance here. Now, sometimes the Bible does give the language of appearance. Like when the Bible says, for example, the sun went down or the sun rose. Okay. Well, technically speaking, that's you know metaphorical language. It's figurative language. It's uh, language of appearance because the sun doesn't go up and down. The sun... Only from the perspective of us looking through the horizon does the sun go up and down, okay? The sun's actually moving in a circle, all right? It's not going up and down unless you put a background behind it and say, well, what it's going up and down against. So in that sense, yeah, there is figurative language in the Bible. But, but many times when the Bible addresses this topic, it dispenses with figurative language and uses very direct language, very literal language. And one of those passages that Bellarmine had pointed out to Foster and Galileo was Joshua chapter 10, where you have, uh, as a matter of fact, there was a big battle about Joshua 10 between uh, Galileo and uh, Bellarmine. And, of course, Bellarmine finally won, because this, is, this was the tradition of the church, to take this passage literally. But here you have a passage where Joshua is fighting the, uh, he's fighting five different armies, in one day, and uh, it's amazing when you, <laughs> I mean, these armies were big, and you have these little puny Israelites there, uh, they took the top of the mountain so that uh, they could look down at their aggressors and their their enemies and, and be able to defeat them much better than if they were on level ground, and uh, one of the reasons why we think Joshua wanted the sun to stand up in the sky was because if you're on the top you're on the mountain, and you're looking down at your enemies. Well, you want the sun in their eyes, you see. So the best way to do that is to keep the sun up there at noon and have, have the, the, your enemies blinded, basically, and you can go slaughter them. That's what they think the, uh, the, the uh, military strategy was that Joshua was using, and it's, that sounds pretty logical. Mm-hmm. But the only way you could do that, of course, is if you had the sun staying up in the sky. And so Joshua prays this prayer to God. And he says, uh, keep, this, keep the sun up in the sky. And it says, God answered him like he had answered no man before in history, nor, nor any time after that. He, he stopped the sun in the sky. And so Joshua was able to defeat these five armies in one day, uh, in one extra day. And uh, then uh, Joshua also says that the moon also stopped. Well, that's an interesting tag to put on this passage. The moon also stopped. All right, so that if, if you're going to get an astronomer now to go and analyze this passage 
and he sees, let's say, let's say he takes it literally, he says the sun stopped and the moon stopped. Well, that's different than saying just the sun stopped. Because if it's just the sun that stops, somebody could say, well, maybe it was the earth that stopped rotating. You see, that would, that would, all, that would make it appear as if the sun stopped. Right. Okay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you see where I'm going with this. Yeah, I sure do. Please continue. <laughs> yeah. So he says the moon stopped also, but see, the moon moves independently of the sun. It moves independently of the earth. It moves all by itself. Okay? So if you stop rotating the earth, the moon isn't going to stop. <laughs> it's going to keep on going. All right? The moon, the sun could, you could say the sun could stop if the earth stopped rotating, but not the moon. All right, so there you're stuck. So if you want to do a scientific technical analysis on this passage, you're not going to go anywhere because this passage is built that way. And, and Bellarmine knew it was built that way. You can't fudge it. It's either got to be what it says or it's nothing. Now, the other way they've tried to go on this passage is to say, well, it's just all figurative. You know, when Josh was talking about the sun standing still in the sky, well, they, they go back and they look at that Hebrew word still, and they try to find somewhere where it's used in a passage where it's more figurative and literal. And you know what? There may be one passage that you could possibly, you know, if you squeeze it hard enough, you may be able to come out with a possible figurative. But all the other times it's used, it's very literal. You see, and I've analyzed all these Hebrew words. I know Hebrew, and I, I analyzed it very thoroughly, and I show all the Hebrew words that were used by Joshua, and they all talk about a literal interpretation of this passage. You can't fudge it. You can't go to the direction of making it symbolic or spiritual or figurative. You're stuck with the actual text, and the actual text is written just like you would read a newspaper. And we, when you read a newspaper, do you read poetry? No. You, you know, we don't read any soliloquies in, in the New York Times. When you read it, we read, John Doe was at the bank at 2 p.m., and he stole the money, and the cops chased him. You see, that's the way Joshua 10 is written, just like it was a newspaper. And so there's no room there to say, oh, we've got figurative language here. No, this, this is straightforward language. And if it's straightforward, then you need to analyze it that way. And if you do, then you find out that the sun and the moon both stopped. And you know the only scientific way to explain that is if both bodies were moving previous to God stopping them and then stopped for a whole day when God stopped them. And it cannot be answered by a rotating earth. So there you have it. That was the argument that that Bellarmine gave to Galileo. And uh, it was good enough uh, for the Pope, and he approved the condemnation, and uh, there we have it, you see. So that's just a, a roundabout way of telling you how the uh, the Church and the Fathers and uh, the hermeneutical analysis all work together. Is there anything? Is there anything else that you'd like to impart to the uh, to the listening audience, Doctor? Yeah, I, I want to re- reiterate that point that I made about Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, because uh, you know. <laughs> All this controversy we've had about Vatican II, finally, in my mind, it was crystallized as to where it all came from. And uh, when Ratzinger said it, he said, Vatican II was initiated because of the Galileo affair. And he did say there were other things, but he didn't name what those other things were. The only thing he mentioned as the impetus for Vatican II was the Galileo affair. All right? Now, this is crucially important for Catholics and everybody to understand that we might not have had a Vatican II if we had settled the Galileo affair in the correct way. But because, uh, well, we actually did settle in the correct way because the Pope condemned it. But I'm talking about the aftermath where the, the cardinals and the popes finally began to succumb to the scientific uh, uh, oh, yes. uh, avalanche and, uh, you know, started saying, yeah, well, maybe science is right and the church was wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, so you're going to have to, the church is going to have to have a day of reckoning. They have to have a day of reckoning, because if the church said Galileo was wrong and put the full weight of her magisterium behind it, 
And then we have some popes and cardinals later on saying, well, we're not too sure about that. You know, science is pretty good, and, you know, we're learning a lot more things. Well, then you're going to have to have a day of reckoning. Are you right or are you wrong? You see? And there's no in-between. Either the sun goes around the earth or the earth goes around the sun. You can't have an in-between with that, you see? <clears throat> so it's all, it's almost as though in quotes in quotes the the church doubted herself yes. the traditions of the church. You know? yeah. As a matter of fact, that's the exact language that he uses, Ratzinger. The church doubted herself. Mm-hmm. You see, so she had to find some way. Well, how can we get out of this? How can what can we do? Well, well, let's be more open to the world now because we we can learn from them. Of course, you see, because after all, they taught us that the Earth does go around the sun. What more can they tell us? Well, let's go shake hands with them and, and learn so much more from them. And there you have it. That's the beginning of ecumenism right there. And it doesn't stop with the world, with science. Now, let's go examine all these other religions now. Let's see what they can tell us. Yeah, they're all monotheistic. Maybe they have something important they can tell us because, hey, we missed the fact that the earth was going around the sun. Maybe we missed something about our own religion. You see? And so on and on and on it goes. Maybe we miss something about the role of women, and maybe we miss something about homosexuality, and maybe we miss this and that and the other thing. You see, when you admit one mistake the church made on a major issue, then you open it up for every other issue it's that's going to come down the, to pike. It's, you a, see? it's a chink in the armor. A chink in the armor, and uh, there it is. Yeah, that's there exactly what they There was no defined. real chink in the armor. You know? There was no real chink in the armor. You know? That's right. Uh, yeah, so that you asked me for the most important point, that's the most important point. Mm-hmm. We would not be in the controversy we had today if the church had kept its faith in Scripture and in its tradition on this one point, that the earth doesn't move. And we would have, we would have conquered the world. We would conquer the world for Christ. But here we are, sitting on our thumbs, because we're equivocating about Scripture and about our tradition, and we've made all these mistakes in the past, and now we're going to clean it up in our era here. Yeah, and all they've done is they've made it worse, ten times worse. Putting our light under the bushel basket. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, all all they've done by their equivocation is now the world comes in and fills the vacuum with all their garbage, and we start to live by it, you see. So that's why I'm here. I want to turn it around, and I hope I have the Lord's blessing, and I hope Carl Keating sees it, because he needs to see it. If he's going to be a spokesman for the church, he needs to stop this stuff, and he needs to realize that this is the only way we're going to change the world. We made a big mistake, and we need to. that's what we need to clean up. The mistake we made is not believing what the church told us in the 1600s about this issue. That was our mistake. And we need to go back there and retrace our steps. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Philosophy Think Tank. I'm Live Mike. Uh, We have been blessed and uh, delighted to have had uh, Dr. Robert Sungenis as our guest. I can encourage people enough to please visit his website. Um, Galileo was wrong. Is it Galileo was wrong dot com? Yes. Okay, and you can pick up the, his three volume work there, and also um, look to uh, theprincipal.com, is it? Yes. Um, where you can find. Theprincipalmovie.com. I beg your pardon. The, theprincipalmovie.com, where you can find more information about uh, the release. And uh, so, anyway, listen, folks, thanks ever so much for being here, and I uh, hope to see you next week.